in the previous lecture we were looking at how to realize an op amp amplifier using a single battery okay normally you need uh, normally you need dual supplies normally meaning uh, the prototype amplifier that we realized had uh, dual supplies that is with respect to ground you had a positive supply and a negative supply this is so that the output signal of the op amp can swing both positive and negative with respect to ground now sometimes this is inconvenient and you want to use a single supply voltage that is a single battery and we saw how to do that basically first of all ground shifting you know that any node can be designated as ground then all that happens is every voltage in the circuit will be translated by some fixed amount equal to the amount of ground shift okay So, the original circuit we had, we had the signal V i R 2 R 1 the load R L. and the positive supply V D D and the negative supply V S S and this point was ground. So, now this uh, the output of the op amp can swing all the way to plus V D D or all the way to minus V S S ok. So, this is the classic non inverting amplifier we have. We also know that this is exactly the same as so let us say add a voltage V s s to the input voltage V i and this ground point here. I connect it to V S S. Okay. Basically, the voltages here are if this is 0 volts, this is plus V D D and this is minus V S S. Now, if I add plus V S S to everything, every voltage in the circuit nothing changes, right. Then this point becomes 0 volts and you can call that the ground, that is the idea. Okay. And the R L also you need to have a series voltage of V S S okay. and then with that modification this becomes ground okay. and this is now a single battery of value V D D plus V S S. Okay. So, this is what we want to realize and the reason to do it this way is also that the input source which is really a representation of a circuit that comes before and the load R L which is a representation of that something that comes after must also be referred to ground. Okay. There may be some exceptions, but this is usually the case. Okay. So, we have to have it like that that is one terminal of R L must be connected to ground although I represent it by a resistor and a resistor does have two terminals which you can connect anywhere as far as the input source and load are concerned we do have this constraint. Okay. They have to be ground referenced. Now, of course, I mean we said we will go from uh, two batteries to one and then we have like three more here this does not make any sense, but we saw how to do this at least in uh, some constraint circumstances. Okay. So, every one of these will have to be replaced with a capacitor that is charged to the right value which is V S S and the way to charge it to the right value is by using our single supply and dividing that. If I have R A and R B and if I make sure that R A by R B is the same as V D D by V S S then across R B I will have V S S okay. and similarly uh, here in series with R L 
I need to have a capacitor that is charged to V S S and here also I need to have a capacitor that is charged to V S S. So, this capacitor I will come to later, it is very similar okay, to what we had. Now, clearly if each of these were infinitely large capacitors, then things would work just fine, because they behave exactly like voltage sources. I mean reality we do not have infinitely large capacitors. So, that means that they will hold the voltage as long as the current through them is not significant. Okay. Then uh, if the current through them is significant, then the voltage will drift in one direction or the other and then uh, you will not it will not behave like a battery of value V S S. Okay. So, last time we did the analysis for uh, this part of the circuit. Okay. Now, this also tells you like uh, this is a already a very simple circuit, but even here you do not have to analyze every part of it for everything. Okay. First, we have to find the signal that appears here at the input of the op amp. So, for that all we need is this part of the circuit I have V i capacitor let me call it C 1. R A, R B, and a single battery of value VDD plus VSS. Okay. This is exactly, and we want to know what appears here. Okay. Now, of course, we can do the analysis, but we already know the solution for DC, and we were also looking at a case where VI is a sinusoid at some frequency, let's say omega. 1. Okay. So, then we do this separately, we already know the solution for DC, I only have to calculate the output of this circuit due to V i. Okay. So, then I even ignore that part and have the equivalent circuit from V i, I have C 1 and what is the resistance here? R A parallel R B. Okay. So, in general there will be some resistance that way and if I call this let us say V x or something, you can calculate the transfer function V x of s by V i of s and it will turn out to be what kind of transfer function is that? It will be some filter, what sort of filter do you get? High pass. So, clearly this capacitor being open circuit for DC, it will not let any DC through at all. Any changes in V i at a very low frequency will be blocked by the capacitor. And beyond some uh, frequency, the impedance of this capacitor becomes much smaller compared to this impedance. So, practically the input gets shorted to the output and V i appears as it is. Okay. Now, of course, that also comes out of the calculation. You saw that the transfer function is S C 1. R A parallel R B 1 plus S C 1 R A parallel R B and the magnitude of this uh, transfer function is like that, where it has a plus 20 dB per decade roll off at very low frequencies and beyond the value of the pole which is 1 over C 1 R A parallel R B. Okay. It is almost 1 and similarly the phase it starts from plus pi by 2 goes to pi by 4 here and beyond the well beyond the pole it will be 0 degrees. Okay. Now, that is what you intuitively see at very high frequencies this is practically shorted here and V i should come out as it is and what is the meaning of coming out as it is the magnitude of the transfer function should be 1 and the phase should be 0. Okay. So, that is what it is. Now, so if you have some frequency omega 1, what you have to do is you have to choose the values of C 1, R A and R B such that omega 1 lies somewhere here. Okay. Is this correct? Is this understood? So, or in other words you have to choose the corner frequency to be much smaller than the frequency of the sinusoid you want to apply. Okay. 
what will you do if you want to if you want the circuit to operate at a range of frequencies not at just at a single frequency. So, let us say you have some audio circuit that has to operate from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz sinusoids of uh, frequency 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. What will you do? How will you choose the component value C 1 R A R B? What will you do? It is not a single sinusoid, but uh, possibly multiple sinusoids. Can we choose the values? Yeah. I want to use this circuit, I want to choose the values. So, what should I do? Huh? You have to be louder. No, no, no. I want uh, I have I want my circuit to operate over a range of frequencies right not just at a single frequency. So, that means that a signal in this entire range of frequency should appear at the input of the op amp you understand. So, what is it that I need to do here? Yes. Yeah, you have to make the constraint true for the lowest frequency that is all because if it is true for the lowest frequency it will automatically be true for any higher frequency. Okay. Obviously, you can never make this work for DC, but if you have a range of frequency, so that means that you have to choose C A times uh, R A parallel R B to be large enough at the lowest frequency, yes. No, 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 I did not say that. I want it to operate from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Okay. If it operates at all frequencies, that is fine by me for now. Okay. I do not need to remove any signal. Because after all like for the first signal first circuit that we had this one this is completely frequency independent right uh, in this form okay, without putting in any other practical detail this will work exactly the same way for any frequency. Okay. So, that is the behavior that we want to achieve of course, because we use capacitors here it will become frequency dependent to some extent. So, but at least in the frequency range of 20 to 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz I want it to be independent of frequency. Okay. So, essentially if you have a range of frequencies you have to make sure that this is true for the lowest frequency that is all that is there to it. Okay. Now, it is typically the frequency that is given and you have to choose R A, R B and C 1 okay. and also remember frequency you just have one equation or one constraint which says that omega 1 must be much greater than 1 over C 1 R A parallel R B okay. and you have like many components C A three components actually C 1 R A and R B. So, how will you choose them? By the way this is a very frequent uh, thing that occurs in design the number of equations that you have is much smaller than the number of uh, design variables. So, you have to have some experience and some uh, intuition to pick something or you start with some arbitrary choices, but you should be able to do the analysis to see how these choices affect every uh, variable and then see. Okay. And even if they are constrained they may not be explicitly stated and so on. So, in this case you tell me like uh, how will you choose R A, R B and C 1 which one bigger than what? How can you compare a resistance to a capacitance man? Huh? I know there are some bazillion choices right. I mean if uh, the product of two numbers is a given number for each number there is like any infinite number of choices. Why? Higher than what? Yeah. So, do not say resistance is higher than capacitance that statement has no meaning whatsoever. So, you have to separately look at what the resistance influences and the what the capacitor influences. Okay. This constraint is fine in this case it is the product of capacitance and resistance whether you increase capacitance by 10 x 
or resistance by 10 x this as far as this constraint is concerned there is no difference, but there are other uh, things that come into play obviously, the power that is consumed in this circuit is inversely proportional to R a plus R b okay, because that is drawing a current equal to the supply voltage divided by R a plus R b. So, you have to I mean ideally you would like to make R a and R b very large, so that the currents drawn are negligible compared to I mean again you have to compare it to something compared to maybe the rest of the circuit and so on. Okay. So, once you pick R a and R b you can choose C 1, so that this constraint is satisfied. Okay. Also, you have to be a little uh, careful. So, maybe I will write it differently. So, let us say C 1 has to be much more than the frequency of operation that is given and R a parallel R b which you have already chosen. The ratio of R and R b there is no ambiguity right. You need a certain voltage across R b so and you have a certain supply voltage. So, there is no ambiguity there at all. Okay. It is only in R a plus R b that there is some freedom. So, you have to yes. Yeah. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. No, no, no. This is C 1 will get charged to V s s. Now, that is with V i equal to 0. Now, if I V i is a DC value, then C 1 will not be charged to V s s, it will be charged to V s s minus V i, but I already said that this circuit would not work for DC, it will work only for sinusoidal V i above a certain frequency, which is given by this constraint. Okay. So, C 1 is much more than this, this also does not tell you the value, right? this gives you a constraint. So, what will you do, how will you pick C 1 in this case? I mean it has to be much more than what is much more than how much more is more. So, let us say what are the units of this number on the right side 1 over omega times r yeah obviously if we got this constraint. So, it has to be farads. So, let us say this number here the right side is 1 nano farad. Okay. So, basically the when you evaluate all the numbers you will get C 1 to be much greater than 1 nano farad or something. So, then what will you actually choose C 1 as micro farad? It can be much greater. So, you can choose micro farads, milli farads, farads anything right, but I mean you should not go crazy either. There are various other reasons, but in this case if you typically choose C 1 to be like 10 times this constraint that is enough or maybe between 10 and 100 you can evaluate. Okay. So, you can evaluate this transfer function at when uh, omega is 10 divided by C 1 yeah please do it quickly and tell me what is the magnitude when omega is 10 times this corner frequency. So, for that you will get j 10 by 1 plus j 10. Okay. I will trust his value it is 0.995 and then also angle 5.7 degrees. Okay. It is 5.7 degrees is a little too much for you, you can choose like 20 times or 30 times and if you choose 100 times you will get very close to 1 with a very angle also very close to 0 degrees. Okay. There is a cost associated with overdoing the constraint. First of all, you will be picking a very large capacitor which will cost more. Let us say if you are building a system, your cost will increase, and also that part I will get to later. A large capacitor will have other non ideal features of its own, which does not make it behave like a capacitor at very high frequencies and so on. So, that we will not worry about now, but and this happens in the lab also. In many cases, you have to choose AC coupling capacitors and you have to choose large capacitor. Large does not mean the fattest capacitor you can find in the box. Okay. Large is in this sense, large for this constraint. Okay. So, please do not stop thinking in the lab and then choose some huge capacitor that you cannot fit on the breadboard and that is completely inappropriate for the uh, context in hand. Okay.
So, that is how you choose it. So, one way to think about it as we have already done is to think of these capacitors as batteries whose voltage does not change. Okay. So, what happens is when you apply a sinusoid here, you can calculate it yourself, you can calculate the transfer function to the capacitor voltage instead of the capacitor, I mean instead of the resistor voltage, then you will find that the amplitude of this voltage is very small okay, if you satisfy this condition. So, that is the meaning of the capacitor being a short compared to the resistor. Okay. If you have a loop of components, obviously around any loop Kirchhoff's voltage law has to be true and if the voltage across any one of them is really, really small compared to others, perhaps you can just replace it with the short circuit. Okay. So, a capacitor behaves like a short circuit at high frequencies, this is what it means. In that particular loop, the voltage across the capacitor is much smaller than all the other voltages. So, that is why you can treat it like a short okay. and it is not a universal thing that a one microfarad capacitor will behave like a short. It may behave like an open circuit in some context and short circuit in some some other context. Okay. So, similarly the exactly the same thing applies here you can calculate the transfer function from this voltage to this voltage and you will find that uh, if the capacitor is sufficiently large what is sufficiently large again you have to calculate you will fire you will have a uh, you will have the capacitor behave like nearly a short circuit and only the signal component of the voltage appears across the resistor. Okay, which is what you wanted. Right? Again, the capacitor will get charged to VSS. Its voltage does change with the signal, okay? but the change is so small that we are neglecting it. Is this fine? And what do we do here? So, please go back and analyze these, otherwise you would not learn anything. This is our circuit. What should I do with this? I had to connect a, a battery of value. VSS. Okay. So, instead of that I want to charge a capacitor to the same voltage and connect it there. Okay. How do I do that? Hmm? I still want to of course, use the same single battery that I have been using. So, what should I do? What should I do? I have to charge it to VSS. Huh? So, I cannot use this voltage source here, right? I mean, that will defeat the entire purpose of this exercise. So, how should I go about doing this? V i to power that, but that would not work right. I mean the signal picture should not change. We wanted an amplifier. So, that means that V i was applied to this terminal and no signal was applied here and the output was coming there. Now, if we go around and change the circuit of course, the uh, circuit will not even perform this function. Okay. So, what I want is I do not want any signal here, but that voltage should be at V s s okay, as far as the D c is concerned. How do I charge the capacitor to that voltage? We have done this before. What should I do? Huh? 
then you are completely first of all I do not think that D 1 works, but then you are completely messing up with the circuit right. How do you choose R 2 and R 1 here? Voltage control voltage source what, what about it? Across R 1 any ideas? What did we do the first time around? Why is this so difficult? What is that? What is the solution? Yeah, you choose another set of resistors that is all. Why Why are we stuck with this R A and R B? We can use R C and R D right. There are letters all the way to Z. So, Remember this voltage is at V S S if I apply no signal. If I apply a signal that is no longer at V S S, I cannot connect it there. Okay. So, I have to make another voltage divider which is easy. I use two more resistors and connect it here and I make sure that R D by R C is uh, V S S by V D D right. So, then across this I will have V S S and that is what I will get charged to and I can use this again with some fine print under some circumstances and so on. I will call this C 3. How should I choose the value of C 3 now? Hmm? First of all should uh, you will have some constraint on C 3 will it be that C 3 must be much more than something or much less than something. Huh? What is the ideal value of C 3 that we want for it to behave like a voltage source? Infinity. So, what do you think the constraint will come out to be? Obviously, C 3 will come out to be much more than some number you have to figure it out. Okay. So, what is that number? So, can you tell me based on your experience with the constraint for C 1? What was the constraint for C 1? Okay, 1 by omega times R A parallel R B fine that is correct. So, now can you look at the circuit and tell me like how that is related to the way the circuit is connected. Yeah fine I analyzed it I got it to be R A parallel R B. So, again I mean all the first order circuits that we did earlier we should have that will have some bearing on this. And of course, while calculating these things you can set V i to 0, because we are calculating the uh, D c voltages and so on. Okay. I explained this earlier also. So, I have V i C 1 R i parallel R b and the constraint is that C 1 is much more than 1 over omega times R i parallel R b omega 1, where omega 1 is the frequency of interest. Okay. So, what is that? What is that number series R 1 series? What is R 1 series R 2? No, no, okay. Yeah, let us get back to that constraint. So, from just by looking at this circuit, tell me what this is saying. I mean, what is this constraint saying? Hmm? I know that it is, I know how to read it C 1 much greater than 1 over omega 1 times R A parallel R B in terms of uh, component values and so on. You did so many things with first order circuits, right? You can calculate so many things about first order circuit simply by looking at it. There was a point to it. What what can you say now? Exactly. So, it is a first order circuit that means that somehow or the other you can reduce it to a capacitor in parallel with a resistor and the impedance of the capacitor should be much smaller than the impedance of the rest of it that is uh, the resistors that are connected across it. Okay. So, if I set V i to 0 what is the circuit I get? R A parallel R B. Okay. 
what is the saying? What is the impedance of the capacitor at a frequency omega 1? 1 by not j uh, or okay, yeah, in case of impedance, there is yeah. So, uh, the reactance is the real part, right. So, 1 over omega c 1, this should be much smaller than R a parallel R b, okay. So, that means that if you have uh, if you apply a voltage around this loop, there is very little voltage across this compared to the voltage across that one, okay. And this constraint is exactly the same as that, that is pretty obvious, right. Okay. So, this is the shortcut of course, do not blindly use the shortcut first understand how these things come about. You can evaluate the transfer function of the entire circuit one of the ways of doing it is you calculate the transfer function from wherever to wherever okay. v i to v naught including all capacitors it will be some extremely messy expression okay. and then you take the limit with the capacitors going to infinity you will get some other expression ok. So, somehow you have to make sure that uh, the constraints on these should be such that the exact transfer function reduces to that one ok that is the idea right. So, finally, if you do all that you will get this and this makes physical sense also that means that there is very little voltage across this what is the total voltage across C 1? it is due to V d d and V s s and due to V i. Finally, the point of saying the reactance of the capacitor should be much smaller than the resistance that is across it is equivalently saying that the signal component of the voltage across the capacitor is very small. Okay. In fact, it should have been 0, but of course, we cannot get 0 with a finite valued capacitor. So, we will get something very small. Okay. So, that is the constraint. So, let us also do it for C 2 before we proceed to C 3. Okay. And also one more thing when you have multiple capacitors in a circuit although I said earlier you can evaluate the entire transfer function it gets very messy if you take all capacitors together. Again we are not looking for exact analysis and finally, we only want constraints right we want C 1 to be much more than something we are not looking for C 1 equals some exact value. So, what is the trick that you can use to simplify the situation? What is a simple strategy? I mean I do not want to evaluate the transfer function V naught by V i with all three capacitors in the picture. So, what can I do, but I do want to evaluate the constraints for each of them. So, what is a simple strategy you can use? Huh? What is that? Now, whatever you answer please answer loudly otherwise I cannot even hear what you are saying. Exactly. So, you want the capacitors to be short circuits. Okay. So, you take one at a time and the remaining capacitors you assume that you have chosen rightly. So, they are already short circuits. Okay. That is a very clean thing to do. So, that is what we will do. Okay. So, now we will do it for C 2 using the simplified method. Okay. So, what did I say? How do you how do you write the constraint on the capacitor? What did I just say here? the reactance of the capacitor should be much smaller than the resistance across it. Okay. So, now you have this capacitor C 2 you forget C 1 and C 3 and so on assume that they are actually dead shots. Okay. So, what is it that you have to find you have to find that you have to write a constraint that the reactance of the capacitor should be much smaller than the resistance across it. So, all you have to do is find the resistance across the capacitor. So, what is that? what is the resistance that appears across the capacitor here? Hmm? My capacitor is connected like this. The picture looks something like this, right? There is some circuit on this side, some other circuit on this side, and C2 is connected between them. And if I ask you what is the resistance across the capacitor, how will you go about finding it? Yeah, so 
you have two circuits you find the resistance looking this way between this point and ground you find the resistance looking that way between this point and ground and add up the two that's all right because this picture will be finally reduced to r a and r b okay and then what will you do what is the resistance across c2 now r a plus r b okay i mean if you can directly find out as you suggested by finding the entire resistance that's fine but if you this may be simpler because you have two parts of the circuit and you find the resistance for this one and that one so let's do that what is the resistance looking back this way this we have done before by the way what is it what is the resistance looking back that way that is between this point and ground okay assume that c3 is a short and so on what are we looking at what is that r1 plus r2 why what is zero why yeah it's basically the output resistance of the voltage control current voltage source we made right this is the voltage control voltage source because of feedback again i mean for many of these things you can approximate it's either zero or some very low value in case of finite gain okay see you can't i mean you have to be able to get the answers even if they are not accessed by the right keyword okay so i'm sure if i asked you what's the output resistance of the circuit you would have probably said zero but uh, now we are calculating capacitance value but we are calculating exactly the same quantity so it is zero so here we have zero so what is the resistance looking back this way that is between this point and ground huh rl that's all so what is the constraint on uh, c2 the reactance of the capacitor should be much smaller than what rl that's all okay so this does work so again you do the hard thing finding the transfer function and then related to this where you find the resistance across the capacitor this is also the reason why all these things are useful right in the tutorials you were asked to evaluate the time constant or corner frequencies of first order circuits first by evaluating the whole transfer function and later there was also something where you had to look at the circuit and somehow tell that what did you do you had to essentially calculate the thevenin resistance that appears across capacitors right this is true in any first order circuit and this is why it's useful and you have to be able to do this especially if you want to take up circuit design as a profession i mean these are not the things where you have to be you can be spending like uh, hours and hours of calculation okay these things you have to be able to see right away it's okay if you don't uh, if you're not able to see it right now but uh, over time you have to be able to do that okay so now with the experience of calculating c1 and c2 let's do c3 in the same way so what should i do so i mean this may be a little uh, confusing or this is okay yeah so this is fine so what if this is fine it's not a problem so I, what's that r a r r d so you are saying basically the resistance that appears across c3 is rd right but this is connected to so many other things rc rd this way huh so again we have a situation something like this except c2 is not connected like that you can again i mean you can combine everything and calculate it but if you have two parts of the circuit you could also do it uh, separately this is up to you how you do it okay so you can look this way you can look that way let's say you get rx and ry what is the resistance that appears across c3 rx parallel ry okay you can do it this way or you can apply a voltage source and find the entire resistance in one shot that is also fine okay so now what is the resistance looking this way across c3 ha huh? 
or say parallel RD, okay, at least it is never RD. What is the resistance looking this way? Huh? R? RL. Why? Where is RL? I mean, that is not even close to this. Okay, well, if it is RL, that is fine, but explain why it is RL. Yeah, but I mean, what what happened to all the things along the way? I mean, calculate it, please. What is the resistance? You assume C1 and C2 are short and VA to be zero. That is a given. Okay. What I want is the resistance between this point here and ground. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. R1. R1. Why? So, I have said V i to 0. So, this is at 0 volts. Okay. The op amp is still in negative feedback with an infinite gain. So, this voltage is 0. Okay. So, if you apply a test voltage here, we test what is the current that flows? V test by R 1. So, the resistance looking this way is just R 1. Okay. So, just because you see a string of resistors do not add up all the values, you have to evaluate it. And when you have control sources, this is the point of using control sources, right. So, if you have just a like a string of resistors, you can add them up, but with control sources, you can get different results. And in fact, those different results are interesting, and that is why we want control sources. We put so much effort into building them, okay. This also has been calculated before. Do you recognize this? This answer R1, where did we calculate it? It may be harder to recognize now with the limited experience with the op-amp circuits that you have. If I call this R2 and R1, it is exactly the same quantity that we calculate as the input resistance of this. Okay. So, this plus terminal is at ground and that is true here because V i is shorted. So, if you look at this point as the input and this point as the output, it is actually the op amp inverting amplifier. Okay. So, this okay, I can see this will take some more time to get used to simply because the circuit is drawn differently, right. But you should be able to after a while recognize this also. Okay. So, what is it that we want now? One over omega 1 C 3 must be much smaller than what? 1 over R 1 R C parallel R D. How would you choose R C and R D? No, that is okay the ratio, but the absolute values of R C and R D very high. Okay. I, again, because I mean see all this is extra right, all these are just consuming extra current oops. all this stuff is consuming extra current. So, you will choose R c and R d to be very large just like R a and R b. Okay. Oh, so, once you do that roughly speaking you can say this has to be 1 over omega 1 c 3 has to be much smaller than 1 by sorry I think I this reciprocal is not there right it is just the resistance. So, this is just R 1 because R c and R d is typically bound to be much more than R 1. Okay. So, what is that saying after all if you look at only that part of the circuit? So, let me go back to the original version where I did not have any other capacitors. I will draw it like this. This is our non inverting amplifier right R 2 and R 1. So, how did this work? The negative feedback induced a virtual short. So, this voltage is at V i, this current is V i by R 1 and the same current flows here. Okay. Now, if you hang a capacitor here C 3, the current here becomes V i divided by R 1 plus 1 over S C 3. I do not, I want the circuit to behave nearly the same as before. So, I want the magnitude of this to be much smaller than R 1. Okay. So, that is all that is there. Is this okay? So, essentially you can get it from the transfer functions. 
but because you know the property of uh, first order circuits the pole value of a first order circuit is simply you identify the capacitor identify the resistor across it and the reciprocal of the product is the pole okay so from that you can also form make a simpler rule that you evaluate the what the resistance is across the capacitor and make sure that the capacitive reactance is much smaller than the resistance okay so that's how you uh, these are called ac coupling capacitors and bypass capacitors essentially they block dc and they allow ac right that's most obvious when you look at uh, this one. So, here if V i is DC, this C 1 will simply block it that will not appear here. Okay. If V 1 is an AC signal that appears there and similarly, uh, I will describe these terms a little more in the next class. So, the DC value here is blocked okay. only the AC signal the sinusoid passes to the load. So, these are known as AC coupling capacitors or DC blocking capacitors and so on okay. and they are used very widely and you need to know how to calculate their values. And of course, if you had a bag of like really huge capacitors, you think you may be able to use them, but you can't because that introduces some bigger set of problems. Not to mention, if you use an unnecessarily large value, you are increasing the cost of whatever you are building. Okay, so you choose the. I mean, you use the constraints uh, from the theory that you know and choose the values appropriately. 